Hello everyone, welcome back to another Live at Five. I'm your host, curator with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research, Kevin Adkison. And today I want to talk about Cranbrook's largest sculpture, uh, which is from 1998. It is by the artist Mark de Suvero, and it's titled For Mother Teresa. And this sculpture has been out here on the lawn of Cranbrook Academy of Art next to the Art Museum since October of 2001. I thought that today, as we are still enjoying this beautiful summer weather, I would tell you a little bit about Marco Polo de Suvaru, a little bit about how he works and how this sculpture came to Cranbrook. So, just to place us on the campus, I'm standing right along Academy Away with Cranbrook Art Museum there in the distance. And Aliel Saarinen, when he was designing the Cranbrook campus, he actually intended that there would be a dining hall for the art students here and then a dormitory and apartments. And so I would, in Saarinen's design, actually be standing in the middle of a quadrangle. That never happened, obviously. And instead, there were a series of very large elm trees that were here. And those elm trees began dying in the 1970s, and the last of them came down in the 1990s. And so the Marc de Suvaro sculpture was placed in essentially a new field, what had always been a sort of um, tree-lined piece of grass was suddenly empty. And Mark de Suvaro is not a Cranbrook graduate, but he is one of the most significant American sculptors working today. He is 86 years old. He is very much still working. He works, he has studios in Astoria, Queens, New York, as well as in Palomona, California. And Mark de Suvaro was uh, born in 1933 in Shanghai. And his earliest experiences with art and the power of architecture and art were at the Forbidden City, which is when he learned to admire the poetics of space. He was born to Italian uh, Sephardic Jewish parents who his father was an Italian naval attache. They immigrated to California in 1941 uh, uh, before World War II. And so Mark de Suvaro grew up uh, or went to school in California, and then he started his studies at the City College San Francisco, and then studied at UC Santa Barbara. And while he was at UC Santa Barbara, he was a philosophy major, and he came to the realization that he was never going to have an original thought in philosophy. And so he was sort of distraught by this um, realization, and he had also been uh, inspired by a teacher at a much younger age who told him, you read too much, you should do things with your hands. And so taking these early lessons, he began studying sculpture. He transferred to UC Berkeley where he graduated in philosophy, but he by that point was actively making sculpture. And so he moved to New York in 1957. And by 1960, he was one of the hottest artists working in New York, reviving this sort of Russian deconstructivist aesthetic and working in abstract expressionist sculpture. We often think of the abstract expressionist as painters, but of course there were uh, all media of abstract expressionist and Mark de Suvaru really led the field as a sculptor. What's interesting is he would not necessarily call himself a sculptor. He might call himself a structuralist. And I was able to chat with one of his um, assistants today, Christopher Yaki, who told me that he would actually refer to Marc de Suvaru as a poetic structuralist. And so those early New York sculptures were often made of found materials, so made of um, wooden trusses from old buildings that were being demolished in this heyday of urban renewal in the 60s in New York. He would use um, old tires and scrap metal, as well as structural steel. 
and he eventually got a grant for a few thousand dollars, and with that grant, he bought a crane. And I believe he is the first sculptor to not use a crane as a way of moving sculpture or a way of seeing sculpture, but instead uh, to use the crane as a tool of the sculptor. And so Marc de Suvru really uses it in the same way that Carl Millis used his clay tools or uh, Michelangelo used his chisels. Marc de Suvru used this rundown crane that he had to uh, repair from its two broken engines. Um, and he found a, a crane operator in Canada who would teach him how to actually use the crane. Uh, and he describes it as being like a virtuoso pianist who had never found a piano. And that once Marc de Suvaru found the crane, he had found the instrument, the tool that would define his life. Also in the early 60s, um, on exactly March 26, 1960, he was working a series of construction jobs. He had been a house painter, he had been a boat builder, and he was working in New York as a construction worker uh, when he got into an elevator shaft accident and he broke his back, uh, totally destroyed his spinal cord. He was told he would never walk. It took four years before he would walk again. In that time, he taught himself how to arc weld, and that became the sort of technique that Marc de Suvru is most known for, are these arc welded um, sculptures. It was something that he could do sitting down, and it is something that he can still do at the age of 86. He did eventually learn to walk again, but the complications from that accident, he does consider himself a handicapped artist, and he um, I mean, he is a handicapped artist and he has uh, really been an advocate for those with disabilities and for other sort of social justice causes. Starting with his very first artist collective in 1962, he then founded another foundation in 1977, but he's probably most well known and most proud of the Socrates Sculpture Park. And that is a sculpture park that he founded in 1986. He had uh, sort of going from after the accident, he lived in Europe, he exhibited in Europe, he lived in California. He returned to New York and he bought a decaying brickwork pier in the East River off the uh, edge of Queens, and he rehabbed this brick pier as his sculpture studio. You can imagine that he needs quite a bit of space in order to work, but he also began clearing up this old abandoned sort of junk lot. It was a landfill, it was an illegal dumping spot, and he turned it into an illegal park. Um, in the 90s, it became an official city park, and he has used Socrates Park as a place for educating younger artists and for giving new sculptors a place to work and a place for them to develop technical skills from both Mark and his staff. And over 900 artists have displayed at Socrates Sculpture Park. Um, that is also where our sculpture uh, for Mother Teresa was made in the point studio that uh, Mark de Suvaru has alongside Socrates Park. If you've ever been to the Noguchi Foundation, the Suvaru and Noguchi were friends and they were on the same block in Queens. So now we know a little bit more about Mark de Suvaru. And I want to talk about his piece here at Cranbrook. Um, it is actually the second Marc de Suvaru that we have had on the campus. The first came in the late 70s as part of the sculptor in residence Michael Hall's program of bringing visionary American sculptors to campus. Uh, Mark de Suvaro's first piece was known as the Kingswood Swing. Perhaps some of you played on it or saw it um, down by Kingswood Lake. And it was at the end of where now Snake Rock is. And that piece, which was titled Le Petit Clef, or the small key, uh, was a sort of steel structure welded together with a swing hanging down. And so you could actually play on it. And all of his works are meant to be experienced in sort of full dimension. This is not on a pedestal. And so when I see people having picnics under it, even if I think they're a little brave, I do think it fulfills the mission of the sculpture to actually be living and playing and working alongside these pieces. But that program in the 70s and 80s that Michael Hall led, uh, they were temporary works. And so 
Cranbrook did not own the swing. It has been sold to a private collector. I would love to have another Mark de Suvera swing. Uh, but for essentially for the next 20 years, Cranbrook did not have a Mark de Suvera sculpture until this piece, which was made in the 90s and had been displayed from 1998 until 2000 at Chicago's Navy Pier. And on Navy Pier, it was on loan when it was discovered, uh, if you will, by Maxine and Stuart Frankel, who introduced it to another uh, family, friends of Cranbrook, Margaret Margot Cohen Feinberg. And she and her late husband, Maurice Cohen, were from a long um, line of Cranbrook School's students. And so Margot Cohen Feinberg purchased the piece from Mark de Subaru and gave it to Cranbrook in memory of her husband, Maurice Cohen, and in memory of all of the uh, Cohen family members who had studied here at Cranbrook. Now, I want to talk for a moment about how it's actually made. First of all, let's uh, talk about the name for Mother Teresa. Uh, Greg Whitcock, the center director, he thinks almost of this stainless steel piece as being like an offering and of Mother Teresa's legacy of giving and of caring for others and the sculpture is sort of holding out this great stainless steel sort of feature. I always think it looks like a mouse. Other people see a nun's habit, but of course Mother Teresa did not wear a nun's habit, so it doesn't quite work there. Mark de Suvaru would name the pieces after they were made, so he did not set out to make a Mother Teresa piece, but he did quite admire the nun from Calcutta, uh, and he had a deep respect for her work. He names people quite often after American Indians um, and other sort of figures who have given back to the world. And so he, though not being particularly religious and not Catholic, uh, respected Mother Teresa. She died in 97, and after this piece was set up and completed, he titled it for Mother Teresa. Now this big silver thing that is hanging off of it, my Dad has visited one of Mark de Suvero's pieces out west where they actually play it with a mallet. Um, I can't reach it, nor do I want any of you coming by and trying to use a very large mallet to pay, play it. Um, this piece is stainless steel. It's about 5,500 pounds, and it's bent cold. And so there's no heat used to actually soften the metal to bend it. So how in the world did Mark de Suvaru bend it? Well, he uses his torch as a pencil and he essentially cuts out from a flat sheet of stainless steel using the torch. He cuts out the shape flat and then he uses his crane and he, remember he's handicapped, so he is coming up with ways of working that work with his ability and with his sort of process. And he uses the crane and he uses a series of uh, counterweights of blocks and pulleys to essentially just torque using sheer force this stainless steel sheet into the shape that he wants. And with the crane, he'll use as a counterbalance a stack of I-beams, or he'll use 8 foot by 20 foot steel plates. And so for a piece like this that's about 5,000 pounds of weight, he might have used, say, 20,000 pounds of counterweight. And they know when to stop when the crane starts rocking. Um, or know when to stop when, it, when the crane starts losing its balance. You'll notice if you look carefully at the stainless steel uh, hanging piece that it has all of these uh, grinding patterns and those are done by his assistants and he gives the assistants a lot of leeway with the grinding. Um, Mark de Suvaru does paint but he also respects other artists and so um, he's that's not Mark de Suvaru's on, own hand that's created the pattern that's this sort of starburst that whoever was working on this piece in the shop created. Now it's hanging by a cable that's about an inch thick, and that cable is rated to hold tw uh, 20,000 pounds or 10 tons, and so it's not going anywhere. And I was able to be here last year when Chris Yockey, um, the 
artist and assistant to Mark de Suvaru, we replaced the cable. And by we, I mean I sat over there while he and his team from Mark's studio replaced the cable. So don't worry if you're here, if we ever have fundraisers again in person and you're at the tent, in the tent underneath the piece, it's not going to come down on you. And what actually holds it up there, what keeps the piece in balance is this counterweight on this side. And remember that I said Marc de Suvaro considers himself a structuralist more than a sculptor. And so this is structurally load bearing. The piece is actually held down like a crane where you have the heavy counterweight on this side and then the uh, stainless steel piece is held by this counterweight. And in his early years, he was using a lot of scrap material, um, what he could find. And in the California studio, he still uses more scrap material because it's next to a junkyard. Um, but for our piece, for Mother Teresa, everything is new except for these pieces that make up the counterweight. Um, it weighs 5,400 pounds, as you can see here. And this is actually made up um, of a rusted metal truss scrapped from a freeway bridge. And so this is a piece of highway infrastructure that Mark got on his yard uh, and then used as the counterbalance. And Chris told me that Mark doesn't throw anything away. So every piece of steel that he's ever had is on the yard in Queens, um, makes for some difficult space arrangements. And if you go online, uh, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art has two really great documentaries about Mark de Suvaru. It's amazing to watch him work with the crane and the arc welder, but it's also amazing just to see this yard full of steel scraps. And it's actually quite possible, more than likely, that these component pieces were sitting around in the yard, you know, mere feet from each other for years before Mark decided that this piece needed to be here, this piece needed to be here, and that they went together. And so he works at full scale. He does do drawings, but the drawings are more suggestive and more poetic. He doesn't do any type of engineering drawing. He doesn't do any type of sort of functional maquette. He goes straight from this idea in his head to the full 60 foot long steel I-beam. And he works using multiple cranes to sort of lift the pieces into place. He'll work all day and then he'll return to the yard at midnight and he'll take the crane or a cherry picker and he'll sort of zoom around the sculpture. And he thinks that working at night gives him a, a sort of new view on the work and gives him that sort of poetic feeling because the night view of the sculpture and just the mood of being uh, looking at it at a different time of day gives him a whole new understanding of the piece. So I mentioned that the steel eye beams are new. Um, the longest steel beams here, and this one is pretty large even by the scale of his own work, um, are 60 feet from foot to sky, which is a pretty difficult dimension to build in because for transporting these works on the highway, the sort of truck length limit is 45 feet. So it requires special permits to get this thing on the road. It is incredibly heavy and it is fully assembled using these steel plates. So when uh, the cable was replaced last year, Chris then went around and he tightened all of the bolts on the connections. And some of them, it was a little bit disturbing how many times he could crank it to keep tightening. Um, it's perfectly structurally safe. Uh, it's so, it's overly redundant structurally. Um, but just the force of wind on this 60 foot construction will eventually loosen the bolts. So we have to keep tightening them. And it was really quite wonderful to work with Chris Yaki on this project. He studied at Cranbrook. He's from Royal Oak and he went to high school here and he graduated from the high school in 1994. Um, he then went off to Elmira College in New York where he studied sculpture and then he came back to Cranbrook and he studied sculpture at the Art Academy with Heather McGill. When he graduated from Heather McGill's studio in 2000, he went 
directly to work for Space Time, which is Mark Desouvreau's company. And so he's worked for Mark for 20 years, and he helps us maintain these sculptures. Or he helps Mark maintain sculptures all across the world, and he helps Cranbrook maintain Mother Teresa. So it does need to be painted, if you can see that. Um, it's been painted once since it was here, and it is ready for a second painting, as you can imagine. That's really quite a lot of effort and a project, so uh, it should happen in the next couple of years. I want to bring your attention down to Marc de Souvereau's monogram, his signature. He doesn't sign every piece, and he signs them differently. Um, but this is, again, we see how he's using the torch as a drawing tool. And so it's just cut from the torch, and it has um, his initials. So Marco Polo de Souvreau in the monogram. And you can also see where this is the sort of new steel versus the reclaimed truss. One funny thing that Chris told me is that as they're working and they're moving these huge pieces around, if Mark doesn't like the way that something works, if it doesn't quite fit, uh, they call them bushes pieces because they get taken off the sculpture and put in the bushes. And then perhaps at a later date, they'll get pulled back out of the bushes. So let's see. One thing that I asked about was how this beam doesn't go straight. And you see how he essentially uses the beam for its full length. And Chris speculated he was not uh, working for Marc de Souvreau at the time. He would have been in college. Um, but he speculated that, in fact, this is the process. So Marc de Souvreau got the, the larger uh, steel beams up in place. And then when it came time, he wanted to add something over here, and so they welded it together. And so it's the sort of reflecting the construction process and how this piece was actually made. And it is really big. It's really big next to the museum. But Mark de Souvereau would say, well, compared to a mountain, it's not big at all. And if you put the mountain in the ocean, that's not going to raise the sea level even an inch. And if you put the ocean on top of the whole world, then the world's really small next to the sun. So all of this is just really crumb-sized unless you're a baby, and then it's going to be really big. So he has a, a, a poetic understanding of scale and size as well. And he, he likes to think of himself when he's working the crane and moving these huge pieces as like a little ant with a huge twig. And it may not look like he can do it, but he can take that twig and he can move it piece by piece and eventually create something much bigger, much more impressive than anything that you could do all at once just yourself. He has won pretty much every award that you can win in sculpture and arts, including the National Medal of Arts in 2013. And I think it is a really very impressive piece to have here at Cranbrook. Grateful to uh, the Cohen family for donating it. And I think it is this real sort of striking modern sculpture in the midst of our campus. Now, I came out here because of an audience request. So if you have any requests of where you want me to go next with Live at Five, send them in. I can always t uh, research and talk about something. I was not a Mark de Suvaru expert until today. Still not an expert, but I knew enough to give you this uh, tour. I do want to plug a couple of other things that are happening at Cranbrook. On Sunday, August 9th, the Center for Collections and Research will be hosting a online virtual visit to the painting uh, and art conservation studio of Kenneth Katz down in Detroit. And we'll have a conversation between the center director, Greg Whitcop, and uh, the art conservator, Kenneth Katz, talking about a mural from the 1930s painted by former Cranbrook head of painting and president of the Art Academy, Zoltan Zepeshi. So you can sign up for that on center.cranbrook.edu. And since I'm so close to the art museum, I thought I would mention that the art museum has reopened. 
You must buy tickets in advance. They're open Wednesday through Sunday, 12 to 5, and they are also open Thursday until 8 p.m. now. Um, so go online, register for a time slot, and come and visit Shapeshifters, which is an exhibition of contemporary art drawing on the permanent collection of the museum. And lastly, I want to plug for my friends at the Art Museum that they're also coming out with next week an outdoor scavenger hunt. So bring your kids, bring your grandkids. Mark de Suvereau's Mother Teresa sculpture is one of the items on the scavenger hunt. And they're also going to have workbooks that go with the exhibition. So if you're looking for something to do with the little ones, come by the Art Museum uh, or, or go to the website and those will be posted next week. Thanks so much for joining me for this tour of Marc de Suvereau's for Mother Teresa from 1998. Again, I am Kevin Adkison, the curator with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research, and I'll be back next Wednesday, live at 5 p.m. Eastern for another tour of Cranbrook's architecture, history, archives, who knows where I'll be? Please send in suggestions. If there's always something, there's always something more to learn about Cranbrook, both for me 